Okay, I, th I hope that you'll find this interesting because when I taught history, I like to th I like to teach it as a story. And the best way is to start at the beginning and go to the end. Not like they do today with each other, all right? But I think you'll find it very interesting. And when in the near future, hopefully, when I do the Kennedy assassination, you're going to be amazed at how similar the situations were in their deaths. Now, Lincoln, in his time, was an extremely tall man. He was unusually tall. He was six foot four. They didn't have, a lot of places didn't even have beds he could sleep in because they were for smaller people. But he was six foot four. And you know, when Lincoln was running and when he was elected, to me the South made a big mistake. They didn't give him a chance. Because really, as it turned out, Lincoln was the only friend the South had after the Civil War. Now, Lincoln, I'm just going to throw this in for you. When he died and he was carried to Springfield and was buried there in Springfield, Lincoln's remains were removed 17 times, dug up and moved 17 times, the last time on, uh, in 1901. He was buried in 1865, and the last time they dug him up and moved him was, 18, uh, was 1901. Now, when he was nominated and he was on the Republican ticket to run for president, the whole idea was Lincoln had to die. There were those in and around Washington and people in, in Virginia and all around that said, he will never get to Washington. We will kill him before he gets to Washington. And so we're going to start right there today. We look at here the uh, Lincoln was a very, uh, I want to read this to you, who was superstitious, believed that the coming event cast their shadows through dreams and omens. You better know this, because I think you have a question on it. The day after he was elected, he had a dream. Opposite him was a bureau, or you may not know that terminology, a dresser with a mirror in it that you could get your clothes out of and stand in front and look in the mirror. Okay. He saw himself reflected in the mirror with one body and two heads, one very pale. He was startled and he got up, but the illusion vanished. He laid back down again and there was the ghost, plainer than before. Now, Mrs. Lincoln, a different story. She immediately gets real upset over this and she said that it was a sign that he would be elected to a second term, but he would never finish it, that he would be killed. Lincoln himself then became, uh, came became, uh, to believe this very strongly, that he was going to Washington to die. Now, just a second on Miss, Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln met him, met her, I mean. Now, she was of means and wealth, in fact, he once said that her last name was Mary Todd. And he once said that everybody else's last name was Todd. One D was enough, but not for her. She had to have two. And she always told people that I am going to marry a man that will be president of the United States. Now, she did date Lincoln, but she also had dates with Stephen A. Douglas, and they were opponents. Douglas was a Democrat nominee in 1860. Lincoln was the Republican nominee. And Douglas was a short, stocky man, and they called him the Little Giant. But she didn't marry Douglas, who really was a man of means and had the best possibilities to be president. Not Abraham Lincoln, just a country lawyer who rode the circuit. 
But anyway, she married him and she was right. Now, Lincoln left Springfield to go to Washington. He told the people of Springfield there at the depot, he says, I know not if I shall ever return again. He didn't, except in his funeral train after he was assassinated. Now, there were plots. You need to know this, I'm sure. There were plots to kill him before he got, before he got to Washington. Now, the first plot I want to talk about was that there was the leader of this plot was a man by the name of Cipriana uh, Fernandina. That's C I P R A N A and F E R N A T I N A. Now, he was a secessionist, he was, he was a southerner, he believed in slavery and everything, and he sets up this plot. Now, it was a pretty elaborate plot. Now, what they were going to do, when Lincoln gets on his train, the presidential, the car, to come to Washington, they had men in, in cities all along the train route from Springfield to Washington. And as the train passed the checkpoint, they would telegraph back with a code name, just passed. So they knew where he was at because the plot to kill Lincoln was going to be in Baltimore. And they wanted to know exactly when he was going to arrive and so that they would have everything set up and they were going to kill him. Now, there were 20 men involved in this plot. Now, what Fernandina did, he had a bag. He met with them and he had a bag. He had put 20 balls, maybe like marbles, about the size of marbles. He put them in the bag. And he told them, he said, there are, there is rather, one red ball in this bag. Now what you're to do, he was pretty smart here. He said, you put your hand down in that bag and you pull out one ball. You keep that ball clutched in your hand. You are never, uh oh, I forgot, I'm not supposed to move. You are never to reveal what color ball you got. That's not very good odds, is it? One in 20? He didn't tell them this part of it. There wasn't one ball in there. There were eight. Eight men left out of that room believing they were the one chosen to kill Lincoln. Now, the assassination was to take place at the Calvert, C-A-L-V-E-R-T, Calvert Street Depot. You see, when this train comes into Baltimore, it comes into the Calvert Street Depot. Now, in order for Lincoln to get to Washington, a team of horses, Lincoln's presidential car, a railroad car, <coughs> would be hitched to, I don't know how many horses it'd take, and pull it two miles across town. to the Baltimore and Ohio terminal. And then he would go into Washington. Well, what messed up this plot <clears throat> was when he got to Philadelphia, Lincoln unexpectedly got off the train and went out to visit some friends that he knew real well. And later on that night, they decided when he got ready to leave that they would disguise him. and they. He took off his stove top, pat, uh, stove top hat that he was very famous for and everything, and they put a shawl and a coat on him, and they got him to walk hunched over. Six foot four stood out. He stood out, he said. And they lost track of Lincoln between ba uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore. And they arrived at Baltimore very early in the morning. They didn't even know he was there pulled him across town, got him on his car, took him into Washington. So that plot didn't pan out at all. Now, there was a second attempt to kill him. And ladies, this should interest you. She will be a female saboteur. She's going to try to kill Lincoln. 
And she chooses a very, very unique way. Now, gentlemen, listen to me. Be careful on your dates now. She was dressed, she got to the White House, and you can see how easy it was to get in the White House and get close to Lincoln. She was dressed in black mourning clothes. You know, black dress, black hat, black, you know what I'm talking about. And she had a veil over her. She got into the White House, she got up, she got right there with Lincoln. She takes and lifts the veil and kisses him. Now, I don't know who's on the cheek or where, but she kissed him. So be careful, Jim. She had smallpox. She was trying to infect him with smallpox. And smallpox back then was deadly. <coughs> and even if you lived, you were pretty well scarred up. The White House strongly denied this attempt. He said it never happened. It just doesn't happen. But look at Lincoln's medical records. And it shows that in fact he had a very light case of smallpox. She didn't kiss him good enough, I read. You know, I heard the other night on TV, a 97-year-old woman ranting and raving about Mitt Romney and said on national TV, if he is elected, I will take my gun and I will kill him. He used those four-letter words, but she was going to kill him. 97 years old. You wonder, what's happening? Okay, now, we're going to do the assassination in two parts. We're going to take Booth, take him through the day, and then we're going to take Lincoln through the day, bring them together, and have the assassination. But first of all, I'm going to read you, uh, now, here's where, where it, the plot was. Booth was going to kill Lincoln, the president, but, he was also going to kill three other people that night. He was going to kill General Grant, Secretary of State Seward, S-E-W-A-R-D, and Vice President Johnson. And he had men who were to go and kill him. And that the assassinations, all four assassinations, was to take place at exactly 10.15, and I'll show you why in just a second. Now, you see here, see what's going to happen? <coughs> You'll hear at 10.15, and then all of a sudden you start hearing people say, the president was shot. Oh, no, 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 it was the vice president that got shot. Oh, no, no, it was Seward that got shot. You see, and here, 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 and here, all over Washington. You got mass confusion. That gives the assassins <coughs> and the, this group a chance to get out. You see, because it's going to be total mass confusion if this is pulled out. Now, Booth had eight people that were supposed to be in this plot. One was the named Ned Spangler, S-P-A-N-G-L-E-R. He worked at Ford Theater, just worked as a stagehand. He was a drunk. He was to help Booth escape. And there was another man, you might need to put his name in, John Peanut Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-U-G-H-S. John Peanut Burroughs. Slow, mentally. His job that night was going to be to hold Booth's horse. This horse that Booth always rented from the livery stable, was very high strung. And he, when, when Burroughs was to hold that horse, he says, do not let this horse go. You hold this bridle. You don't let him get loose because he'll take off. 
and then I'm going to pay you. He was going to pay him five cents. That was going to be his salary. Another one was George Azerot, A-T-Z-E-R-O-D-T. He was to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson. And that was to take place at the Kirkwood House, or hotel rather, I'm sorry, K-E-R-K-W-O-O-D. Sam Arnold, he was a deserter of the Confederate Army. Michael Lawton, capital O, then capital L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. He dropped out when he found out Booth was going to kill the president. He took off. So he's more or less out of it, even though he will go to prison. John Surratt, he is to kill General Grant. He escapes. This country goes and lives in Europe for a while and was actually a guard at the Papal State, which that's the Vatican. Comes back to this country, tried, but found not guilty. Louis Payne, P-A-I-N-E. Now this was a big man. Very, very slow intelligence. But he, if anybody would get the job done that night, this man will. He will do everything in his power to kill the Secretary of State. See, in fact, they tried about three or four different times to teach him how to get to the Secretary of State's house, and he never could find it. He, he just in that mentality. So, David Harrell, his job is to get him there and to hold the horses. Booth originally decided, thought he was going to take uh, Lewis Payne with him, and then he said, uh-uh, no, no, better not. He may just kill the president, and I won't get the credit. So I'll send him over to kill the Secretary of State. So he, he scratched that. Now, the last one, Mary Surratt. S-U-R-R-A-T-T. -T. Now these are those people right here. There you can see Mary Surratt. Olaf, Harold, Azerod, Payne, Mary Surratt, Sam Arnold, Ed Spangler. John Surratt. That's her son. John Surratt is Mary Surratt's son. Her boarding house is called the nest where the egg was hatched. She is the first woman to be hanged legally in the United States that I could find out. Okay, now let's look at April 14th, 1865, that day. It's called Good Friday. Why is it called Good Friday? Before Easter. Hmm? Before Easter. Friday before Easter, that is right. Now, at, okay, now we're talking right here, 11 a.m. in the morning. 11 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Booth leaves the National Hotel. That's where he lives. He leaves the National Hotel, and he goes to Ford Theater. You know, might think, well, wouldn't that be a little suspicious? Absolutely not. Booth worked there. He was a he played the matinee performance. The matinee performances are afternoon performances, and he played those performances. He was a matinee idol. Women adored him. He was hot. Right, they understand. <laughs> he was hot. But he went there solely to pick up his mail because actors who had no permanent address, wherever they were playing at that time, 
over a period of time would leave that as their address and they would get their mail from the theater of which they were, where they were playing. So this was very normal for him to be there. There was no problem there. Now Ford Theater and, uh, was not the classiest theater in town. It was kind of a second rate. But Lincoln liked to go there because they had a lot of comedy. He liked lighthearted comedy. He wasn't in too much for the serious stuff. <clears throat> now the owner was John Ford. But he wasn't there. John Ford was out of town. Now threw this in for this reason. When he gets back, the government arrests him. Put him in jail for 40 days just because he owned the theater where the president was shot. You can see how this thing is orchestrated here by the government. So the man in charge was Henry Clay Ford. That was his brother, and he was in charge of the theater, and he was the manager anyway. And in the conversation with Booth when he came in to how to do it and all, in the conversation, Booth, he asked, he told Booth, he said, General Grant and his wife are going to be at the theater tonight, along with Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln. It must have angered Booth for just, just a little bit that he would do this. And he asked him, did you ask him? Did you invite him? He said, no. The White House just sent us a letter, sent us a note that they would be here. And he looked. The cast was on the stage. They were rehearsing. The president's box was being prepared. Now, if, just imagine this is the theater out here. thousand seats. And it cost 50 cents a ticket. It was a sellout. Now, here you are right here. This right here is the stage. The president's box was like this. In other words, you're looking down on the stage. The president... If this is stage out here, the president has a side angle, and he's not—he's hardly visible from the audience. You see, the way it's set up. Now, the name of the play was *Our American Cousin*. It's an English play. It was a comedy, but understand about English comedy or English plays. They're dry. It's dry humor. It's not like our humor. It's dry humor uh, in this. Now, they were rehearsing. They wanted everything back. The leading lady in this play was Laura, L-A-U-R-A, King, K-E-E-N-E. This was her 1,000th performance. You'd think by now she'd know the play pretty well, wouldn't you? But they were rehearsing. They wanted everything. And this was the last night of the play. It's history after that night. The box was being prepared. And so Booth was looking for a way to kill the president. I did skip something a while ago. He did attempt to kidnap the president. At first, he wasn't going to kill him. He was going to kidnap him. And he was going to do it at the old soldier's home. And he found out that Lincoln was supposed to be coming out to visit the soldiers. So he stopped the stage or the, the carriage that uh, he was supposed to be in. He was going to take him out, take him to Richmond, and he was going to ask a ransom of all Confederate prisoners of war. This was before the war was over all Confederate prisoners of war, bring them back to the Confederacy, and maybe renew the war. But when he opened the door, Lincoln wasn't in the carriage. It was the uh, Attorney General of the United States. Chief Justice, I'm sorry. Chief Justice uh, Chase. Now, we'll go from there. Booth. Now, I decided, and at that point, he said, heck with this trying to kidnap him. I missed him two or three times. I'm going to kill him. So that's what he's looking for this day. A place, time, to kill him. And he said, this is it right here. So he sits down, and he begins to watch the play. He wanted an exact time. He knew the play. He knew that basically the time schedule of this play. And he began to watch it. 
And all of a sudden, he said, that's it, right there. There's the time. 10-15 is when he's going to kill the president. 10-15. Reason? There will only be one actor on the stage, Harry Hawk. And he will be delivering funny lines. Now that outburst of laughter will muffle the gunshot, won't it? Be harder to hear. A thousand people laughing. If you could laugh, his funny lines, you tell me if they're funny. Well, it says here, the funny lines, well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You sock doggling old man trap. Don't ask me. I don't know how to interpret, but I, I, I don't get any funny. I, it doesn't make me laugh. Now, he also knows there's only one avenue of escape. He can't go back out. Because it's on the second floor, he'd have to go out the president's box, down flights of stairs, and out the front door. No way he'd get away out, could he? No way. He had one avenue. He had. <laughs> Don't come back. Every time I come here, that thing about my feet fall out. <laughs> so, what he had to do after he killed the president takes care of his guest here, Grant or whoever's with him. He's got to go over to the railing right here. Stage is down here. He's got to jump 12 feet. No problem. I'll jump, spin, go outside, go, go out the back door, and I'm gone. That's supposed to take between 60 and 70 seconds. Kill the president, go over the box. Jump over, down on the stage, out the back door, and gone. 60 to 70 seconds. So he had it planned now. He's like, right here it is, it's planned. Everything looks good. Now, he leaves Ford Theater, and he goes to Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D, stable. This is a livery stable. You don't know what they are. You probably never seen one or heard one. It's where they would rent horses and buggies and so on and so forth. And he rented, and don't ask me why, a one-eyed horse. Now, why in order? For pain. And he gave the man instructions. I want that horse ready, fed, groomed, ready to roll, saddled, ready to go at exactly 4 o'clock. I'm going to be here to get it. And I'll be back before then to pay He then goes to Pumphrey's stable, P-U-M-P-H-R-E-Y-S. And there he just rented his own horse, same instructions. Four o'clock, I'll pay you before that. You have him ready. My horse and this horse for pain. Now, 3 p.m., he goes to the Kirkwood house, K-I-R-K. K-W-O-O-D, Kirkwood House. There he's going to see George Adserot. Uh, you up here, here he is. He was to kill the vice president and he wanted to talk to him. Bad news. Adserot's not there. He's out getting drunk. He's wanting out of this plot. He's scared to death. And he's won't now. Now, he then goes downstairs and he asks the clerk, is Vice President Johnson, this was his red, this was the Vice President's Kirkwood House or Hotel, was his place of residence. He says, is the Vice President at home? No, he's not. So he sat down and he wrote the vice president a note, a man he had never met. He writes him a note. Here's the note. Don't wish to disturb you. Are you at home? 
J. Wilkes Booth. Now here is going to be a line that where all day long and up to the assassination, he is going to call attention to himself. He wants people putting him at the time, opportunity, place, and opportunity. He left the news. Even though they had never met, the vice president for a long time will have a hard time explaining that note because he was a southerner, the vice president. Now, okay, now he goes and he picks up the horses and he goes to Deary's, D E E R Y S, Deary's Tavern. Deary's Tavern. There he drinks, I don't know what you need to know, brandy and wine oh, and water. And he writes two letters. One to the editor of the National Intelligence newspaper. National Intelligence. Newspaper. Now he tells him there who and why. Who killed him and why. But now he does a real mean thing. He not only signs his name, he signed every one of those names. No matter what they do from this moment on, they're guilty. They're going to die or they're going to prison for a long time. But he put all their names on that letter. And also he wrote a letter to his sister Asia, A-S-I-A. Same type of letter. Except it goes just a tad bit further. He is scared to death. He's not going to get credit. He gets to thinking, well, what if they just blow my head off? I mean, I am not recognizable when they capture me and they kill me or whatever happens to me. They're not going to know I did it. And I did all this for nothing. So he tells his sister, if that happens, you look, let me get the right hand, on my right wrist, and he'd have been cool today because he had a tattoo. He said, on my right wrist, You'll find a tattoo with the initials J W B. And he signs all eight, his name and all the eight. He signs their name too. So there's two letters that will hang these people or whatever their fate will be. Now, he meets Azerod about 5 o'clock that afternoon. And he told him to kill, that he was to kill the vice president at 10.15. And they were to meet on the far side of the Navy Yard Bridge. Now, this was still wartime, even though the war was uh, uh, over. So it was under military rule. No one could leave Washington. You could not cross that bridge after 9 o'clock in the evening unless you had the military password uh, or, uh, let's see, the military password, it was T.B. Road, R-O-A-D, or you had a government pass that they might issue. That was the only two ways you could possibly cross that bridge, that, those bridges at night. You had to stay in Washington all night because it was under military rule. Now, that's a rod. He cuts out. He goes to Baltimore. He 
He was a man who knew a secret. He was a dangerous man now. He had no intentions of killing the vice president. He was out. He was gone. Now, 6 p.m., he goes back to the theater. He's got a little he's got a little work to do to get ready. He goes back to the theater. He goes up on the second level to the president's box. Now, just imagine, you, you go up stand the, two, the stairs up on the second level. You open a door, and it's not into the box. It's a little corridor, a little bitty room that you walk, or whatever you want to call it. And you had to walk, just say, maybe from here, to send it. And then you would open another door that would take you into the president's box. Now, he goes and he gets a board. Uh, evidently, it must have been something like a two, a two, uh, about two inches thick. And he got it about a half an inch too long. Now what he was going to do was take and put that board against the wall and then against the door, the door leading out into the theater. You understand what I'm saying? He's just going to put it up there. That's good. If you kick that thing in there real tight, he chipped some plaster out, put that board in, he's going to put that board in there. Well, it's going to be hard to open that door, isn't it? Because it's going to be so tight, you got to about chop it down or whatever. But that's going to give him enough time to get out of Dodge, see? And so he sets all up, he cleans up the mess, he checks everything, he looks in, he sees Lincoln's big chair that he sits in, Mrs. Lincoln's, a couch over here that his guest will be on, and he kind of lines things up. He's, this has got to be precise, it's got to be exact. He can't make a mistake. Okay. Now he goes back to the National Hotel. Now, Booth, when he was at that tavern, Deary's Tavern, uh, thinking about this, he also thought about death. And when he goes back here, he's thinking about death. He's thinking pretty good that, hey, there's some possibilities. I'm not going to make it out of this thing. Now, he goes back, he gets everything that he needs, he gets ready, and at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., he leaves for Ford Theater. But look what he does before he leaves here at the National Hotel. He went down to the lobby, and the clerk that was at the desk, they knew each other. He asked him, hey, now, that was a dumb question. Are you going to the theater tonight, Ford Theater tonight? Well, it was pretty obvious he wasn't. He was working. Calling attention to himself. The clerk said, no, I have to work. He said, you should. You will see some very rare, fine acting there tonight. And he left. Now, the conspirators held a meeting somewhere, and I never have been able to find where, somewhere on horseback in Washington, and nobody ever pinpointed it. But about 8 o'clock they met, made sure everybody knew where to go and what to do, the white horse and everything like that. So everything is set to go now. He's done all he can do. It's just, well, how will this thing play out now? Now, Booth arrived at Ford Theater about 9.30. The play had already been going on. Lincoln was already in the theater, seated. Now, he goes in. First thing he will do, he's going to check that box. The president's there, Mrs. Lincoln's there, and their other guest, I'll give them to you in a minute. They're there. Now, when Lincoln got there, he got up to that box about 9 o'clock. The, get, the people in the theater were quite disturbed that Lincoln wasn't there until 9 o'clock. They had paid good money, 50 cents, to get in. 
But he checked everything. Everything. The play was going exactly on time. Everything was good. Then, if you can imagine, the lobby, the big lobby of the theater, and as he would come out, over on this side, there was, you know what saloon doors are, don't you? You've seen them on movies and everything. You know, where you hit them and they stand out. <coughs> I don't mean any of you have been to a saloon or anything. Okay? I know you do that. But it was kind of annexed there where people would get out, go up, eat, have a drink, or at intermission have a drink or what have you. And he went in there and, he be and naturally he bought a round of drinks. Called attention to himself. Talking. Boisterous. And because he was a sellout, he even uh, talked to John Buckingham there, who was the, sold tickets and took up tickets, and jokingly said, I don't need a ticket for this tonight, do And he said, no, of course not. So he was okay, and so he played the scene. Okay, now we're going to leave him right there. Now we're going to pick up the president. We're going to pick up Lincoln. Okay, 7 a.m., This was an exciting day for the president. His son, Robert, and you know, of all of his children, Robert lived to be about 81 years old, something like that. But all the others died very young, even when some died in the hospitals. But he was on General Grant's staff and had been with him at Appomattox. What happened at Appomattox Courthouse? The what? Well, yeah, that's where, that's where Lee surrendered to Grant in the Civil War. And see, his son Robert was there and he knew everything that went on and all that Grant said, all that Lee said, and Lincoln was very excited to hear all of that and thankful that his son was at home. And so that morning, he gets up, he gets dressed, and he went down to have breakfast with his family and with Robert. He's there. And Lincoln had his usual. Had most every morning, this is what he had for breakfast. Bless his heart. Hard-boiled egg. I can't say I'd be too excited about getting up every morning just about and eating a hard-boiled egg. I don't think that'd do much for me. Now, he and Robert talked. He asked him questions. And then he asked Robert, he said, would you go with your mother and I to the theater tonight? And Robert will always regret his answer. He said, no, sir. He said, Dad, I, I, I'm sure I'm just ad living here. No, Dad, I, I, all I want, I've been out in the field, I've been in the war, all I want to do is have a good, clean bed and some good food and just go to bed and get some rest. Well, Lincoln understood that, and so he, he, he didn't go with him. But after what happened, he regretted that he didn't go and at least try to protect his dad. And that would be something to deal with. Now, 11 a.m., cabinet meeting. President, and the highlight is General Grant. Find out what happened. Get all the details. And they talk. But Lincoln made one thing straight. It's a very strong statement about reconstruction of the South. He says we're going to do it with love, not hate. I think that's the best way to do it. Then, when the meeting is over, he asked General Grant for if he and his wife would attend the theater. Well, to make a long story short, General Grant had already had his order, marching order, so to speak, on this deal. Before he even went, Mrs. Grant had already told him, no way are we going anywhere with that woman. No how. Nobody would go anywhere with this woman. Oh, man. 
She had a very bad disposition about her. She would embarrass you in public. She would embarrass President Lincoln in public. She even constantly harassed him about his hair. Of course, y'all would be thankful he's got some. About his walk, his speech, how his feet turned out. And she, she didn't like nothing about him. Never figured out why she married him. But I dislike somebody that bad. But anyway, that she didn't. He just so Grant told him, said, "We have a tickets to catch the two o'clock train to New Jersey uh, to visit with our son, so we can't go." But he could have easily taken a much later train, which was a special, and he would have got there at the same time as this train leaving at two o'clock, because this train stopped at ever cow path and pig path between Washington and New Jersey. You know, it wasn't a super express like this other one. But he wouldn't go. But that was because of his wife. There was no way. Now, after the cabinet meeting, 3, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. He and Mrs. Lincoln go for a carriage ride and his guard, William Crook, C-R-O-O-K, C-R-O-O-K, his bodyguard goes with him. He wasn't supposed to. John Parker was supposed to have relieved him at that time, and he was to be his guard now for that night till, say, about midnight. He was to go with him to the theater and everything. And so Lincoln even told Crook, says, go on home, I'll be okay. And he said, no, Mr. President. Of course, he knew better. He would have been in really a lot of trouble had he not gone with the president. He said, no, I'm going to stay with you. So he goes with him, and they go on the carriage ride. And Lincoln told Mrs. Lincoln about a dream he had. Who's dead in the White House? And it goes something like this. I, he said, about 10 days ago, I retired very late. I had been up waiting for important dispatches from the front. I could not have been long in bed when I fell into a slumber, for I was weary. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. I heard subdued sobs as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left, I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing but the, uh, more, uh, for, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. Not a living person was in sight. But the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. It was light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me. But where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts were broken? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all this? Determined to find the cause of the state, state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived in the East Room. When I entered there, I met with a sickening surprise. Before me was a casket, a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards. And there was a throng of people some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who was dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was the answer. He was killed by assassin. There came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, and I awoke from my dream. Now, he mentioned this dream to Mrs. Lincoln. And she said, well, you tell me what it is. I want to know what it is. He said, no, Mary, it's not important. It's no big thing. I don't care. You tell me. I mean, you tell me right now. You know how that goes. So he told her. Guess what she said then? <coughs> well, I sure wish you hadn't told me that dream. You've got me all upset. Yeah, right. So here we go. Now, Then they go to the water. At 4 o'clock, they go over to the War Department. And there, 
Lincoln went over to get dispatches. They, they could telegraph them in. It was much easier at that time. They, they, they could get them in. And he asked Secretary of War Stanton, S-T-A-N-T-O-N, to go with him. He's very rude. He didn't like Lincoln. I'm not sure he wasn't in on this. But anyhow and anyway, he asked him. He said no. And he wanted to ask Major Eckert, but Major Eckert had heard what he said. And he said, no, I can't go. We've got to work late tonight. So that's two more that just refused to go with him. But the records show they both signed out early that evening. They did not work late. Now, eight thirty. They were ready to go to the theater. President Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln. Major, just put him at J, Harry Rathbone, R-A-T-H-B-O-N-E, and Miss Clara Harris. She was the daughter of Senator Harris, but I don't think that's important for them. But anyway, they were engaged to each other, and so they said yes, that they would go with her. So those four in the carriage, they arrived at Fourth Theater at 9 o'clock. <laughs> they arrived about 9 o'clock. Guess who's at Ford Theater? John Parker. Four and a half hours late. Mm. But you know he was handpicked to guard the president by Mrs. Lincoln? That don't sound good. Now, here was something that was very startling. Other than John Parker, there is no security at the theater. No military, no nothing. The only security is John Parker, a man who arrived four and a half hours late to guard the president. That is not good. They went up to the box. They got there about 9.15. Of course, the play stopped. Lincoln got a standing ovation. Then things settled down, and the play went on. Now, again, as I said, when Parker was sitting up behind the president in his booth, and he's looking down, he can't see the play. So after a very short while, he gets bored. He gets up and leaves. The president now is totally unguarded. Now that he leaves, he goes down to that tavern. He begins to drink. Then he leaves the theater and just leaves the area completely, and he meets up with a lady named Lizzie, L-I-Z-Z-I-E, Lizzie Williams. Miss Williams would be called, I think you'd understand the terminology, a lady of the evening. You'd understand me, don't you? Okay. Okay, now Booth. Come, shows up about 9.30, goes into the tavern again, talking, calling attention to himself. He's checked, plays on schedule. And about 10 minutes after 10, he goes up to the president's box. No problem, no security, no guards, no nothing. Opens the door, slips in, gets that bar. Put it against the wall and against the door. And you can hear the play. And you can hear Harry Hawk delivering lines. He knows it's the exact moment. He then opens the door very easy into the room. There's the president, Mrs. Lincoln, Major Rathbone, and his fiance on the couch. They're in group. They're watching the play, paying no attention. He walks in. He's got 
a derringer, you know, a derringer. That's just a little bitty pistol, one shot, muzzle loaded derringer. Now you can make that pretty powerful because you know anything about muzzle loader? More powder and everything you pack in there, the more kick it's got. Now he's got that brass derringer in his hand. He extends his arm out. His eyes is running over the barrel. Sighting. He's five feet away. He pulls the trigger. Now, you used to, when I did that, I'd be at the back of the room, and I had a starter pistol, you know, like they have them try, and I'd fire it. But they'd go in orbit. Scared of the day. Now, the ball, the lead ball, goes right in about here and comes across. Goes into his skull. Just him. The, the, the president just slumps over. Now, he throws the pistol down and he's got a big knife. Now, I don't know where's a boy knife. Well, Bill just said it was a big knife. Well, Major Rathbone tried to stop Booth. I mean, yeah, Booth tried to stop him. When he did, Booth said, Whoosh! knocked him down and just laid his arm all the way down through here, all the way open. It was open and you could see the you could see the bone and blood just pouring. And I mean that if you have been cut, a cut is just a little cut. You know, cut yourself with a piece of paper. You ever done that? It's a shock. It's just a shock to the bottom. And then Booth, when he knocks him back and cuts him, he gets up on the rail and he jumps. Perfect plan, isn't it? Except one thing. One thing. He forgot, he didn't realize that they had put flags and everything draped down on the wall, that 12 foot drop, that wall there, was draped with flags. And when he jumped, his spur on his left foot caught a terrible yank. And it breaks a bone in his leg. It was the, uh, he it. Well, doggone you, what's the fibula? The fibula, F-I-B-U-L-A. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he didn't just break it. It was a compound break. And before this whole event, this night's over, that bone, that jagged bone is cutting through the skin, and he's riding a horse at high speed. Can you imagine trying to ride a horse with, with a bone in your leg broken and trying to poke through the skin? He's going to be in a lot of misery. But right now, he's not hurt. That adrenaline's flying. Anyway, he jumps up. And he shouts to the crowd, Sick, S I C, Semper, S E M P E R, Tyrannius, T Y A N N I S. That means ever thus to tyrants. They said, they said, that's the Virginia motto. It's on the Virginia flag. Uh, somebody even wrote, he said, uh, I've done it. I think he said, Golly, I broke my leg. I don't know what he, but anyway, I'm pretty sure that's what he said right there. Here with us, the tyrants. And he jumps up, and he shakes that bloody dagger of a thousand people. Now, there can't be any doubt who did it, can And old poor Harry Hawk, he's standing over this way. I don't want no part of this. And he didn't even attempt to get him, and then he's gone. He gets out back there, gets on his horse. Takes his good leg and kicks Peanut Burroughs, knocked him away and didn't even give him his nickel. And he gallops off, heading for the Navy Yard Bridge. He's gone. Total chaos in the theater. It wasn't long before the people who paid to get in, you know what they wanted to do? Take every cast member in that play out and hang them to the lamp post. Hang them. And they had no more to do that than you did. But they wanted to hang them. 
But there was only one way to get in that booth quick. So they hoisted. Oh man, I got to hit him, Chip. That's okay. Dr. Charles Leal, L E A L, up into the booth. They just hoisted him up into the booth where he could get the Lincoln. To make this short, uh, you see, when he got up there and looked and he saw Major Rathbone with the slash, he believed that the president had been stabbed. So he's looking for stab wounds. And so he gets in, gets some of them that they got up in there and hit him. And they pulled that bar out and got people up there, soldiers. Maybe. And they laid him out and stripped him to his waist. And he was hunting stab wounds. Couldn't find one. And then he felt something. And he run his hands up the side of his hair like that. And he felt something wet. And then he found where that musket ball had gone in his head. But by that time, it had stopped oozing and bleeding. And Brent Lincoln was laboring to breathe. So he takes his finger, and he takes it and goes in that wound, and opens it up and gets it union, and it, Lincoln is able to breathe better. But when he diagnosed him, looked at him, opened those eyes, he knew. And this doctor is only 21 years old. Most of his experience was in the field during the war. But he diagnosed it as a as the, the, that he would die. And I mean, he had enough experience there because he saw enough of that in combat. So he decided, well, we've got to get him out of here and get him across the street. So the soldiers picked him up, picked up Lincoln, and they carried him out, carried him down the stairs. And as they got outside of the theater, I can't, I don't know his first name, but his name is Peterson. Last name was Peter. He had owned a Peterson boarding house directly across the street. He motioned for him. He says, take him upstairs in such such a room, and they did. But they had to lay him sideways in the bed for him to fit at all because he was six foot four. So he's there. Okay, now I want to just leave him right there. Well, no, I'm going to go ahead and finish this up. Okay, now he stays there that night. Secretary, St Secretary of War Stanton comes in, takes over. In fact, he runs the country for about two and a half weeks. And he gave orders that Mrs. Lincoln was not allowed in the room because she's going nuts every time she came in there telling Lincoln not to die and so on and so forth. But anyhow, he wouldn't let her come in until the very end. He kept her out of there. And so finally, Lincoln died April 15, 1865. Seven twenty-five, fifty-five. That's twenty-five minutes after seven fifty-five seconds. Okay, they didn't keep that pretty close. Could have just said seven twenty-six, could have. But they gave it exact. That's when he died. Doctor Leal then took two fifty-cent pieces and laid them on it, closed his eyes, and laid them on his eyelids. Because sometimes corpses' eyes would come back open. They, they shut. So, have you ever heard the expression pirates and all these things? They steal the pennies off a dead man's eyes. That's where this comes from. Years ago, and this went on for a long period of time, that they would, when people would die at home especially, that they would put coins in their eyes. Now, I'm going to stop right there on that. Going back here, And <coughs> Booth is gone now. Secretary of State's seat. We're going. We're going to look. Uh, 
they take care of him now. David Harrell and Payne arrived at about 10.15 at Secretary of State Stephen's house. They were going to kill him. Now Payne, Payne's, uh, Payne was going to be the one to go in and kill him. Harold was going to stay with the horses and keep them. And Harold, Harold was going to be the guard, which he was happy to do that. Now, Payne was slow, but he, was going, he worked at a drugstore, so he was going to try to pass himself off as a drugstore delivery boy. And so he goes and knocks on the door, and the servant, I want to see you in service. Now, look at this path here, up and back. See, uh, see the servant came to the door. Payne told him what he wanted, and he said, I've got to deliver this medicine to the secretary in person. He said, no, you can't do that. He's not to be disturbed. He's in bed. He's trying to sleep. No. Well, that was a bad choice. Because he beats the servant, hits him, beats him. Oh, no, he, he cut him. I'm sorry. I got to get my hand. I'm sorry. He cuts him, leaves him in a pool of blood, laying there in the doorway. That's one. Got five more to go. He then goes up the stairs. He gets to the top of the stairs, and Frederick Seward tried to stop him. He pistol whipped him, beat his head in. He beat him in the head with pistols, and he suffered some pretty uh, pretty good brain damage in this. That he, he suffered from this pistol whipping that he got here. He's laying in the floor of the blood. Now he gets to the secretary's room. Secretary's room. And he's Got his knife. And he goes in there and he slashes the Secretary of State Seward there in the bed. And he gets him and he cuts him all the way down here. They say that you could look and see his teeth on the inside. He's buddy. Then he grabs his hair and tries to turn him over to slash his throat, but he's got one of those collars on because he'd been in a real bad carriage accident. And Stephen rolls over into the floor. About that time, his nurse, Sergeant Robinson, comes in. And he, he beats him, too. So they're all in blood. As he starts to leave, his 20-year-old daughter, Fanny Seward, comes in, and he, he beats her, too. He, he's not prejudiced. Tough. Now, he's down the stairs and out. He left six victims in blood. He didn't kill anybody, but he did his best. Well, no, I forgot one on his way out, Augustus Seward. Uh, he, he beat him too. When he gets out, pain, uh, uh, when Payne got out, Harold had already left. He heard the commotion. He took off. He didn't know where to go. He couldn't find the Navy Yard Bridge. So he goes back to Mary Surrett's house. I have read, I don't put much stock in this, but they say that he hid in a cedar tree for a couple of days. He may have or he may not. Like I said, I don't put much uh, stock in it. One thing I didn't mention a while ago at the theater, I don't know that this is all that important, but I said there was no security, but within minutes after the president was shot, there were over 200 soldiers at the theater. Now, we've got all that. Now, Booth and Harold get to the Navy Yard Bridge about 1045. And they gave him the password, as I said, I don't think TB Rose, and they crossed over into, they're, into Virginia, they're, they're in Virginia. Or oh, Maryland, I'm sorry, they're in Maryland. They go to Surrettsville. S U R R A T H V I L L E. There they picked up supplies. Mary Surratt supposedly, according to the government, left for them. They drank a dollar's worth of whiskey, boasted that they'd killed the president. That's real smart. 
But now plans have to change. He's got to have a doctor from that lady. Saturday, April 15, 1865. Bryantown, Maryland. They visit Dr. Sam Mudd or Samuel Mudd. He fixes his leg, but he is in a tremendous amount of pain and trying to ride. And Dr. Mudd will get life in prison for this, and he really didn't have anything to do with it. Then he goes on and uh, all there. He, he gets a ride with uh, Oswald Swan, gives him $7 to take, take him to Captain Cox's house. <coughs> I don't think he did. For five days, he stayed in a, a Captain D. stayed in a pine thicket and he gave him food and information, and that's when Booth got the shock of his life. As he read the newspaper, he found out he was not a hero in the South, which he expected to be, and that disturbed him. So, okay, now he goes on from there to, uh, he finally ends up at Richard Garrett, G A R R E T T house. He ends up at Richard Garrett's house. And he asked Garrett if he could buy two horses. Well, Garrett thought, well, wait a minute, there's something suspicious about this. They're going to steal my horses. So he put his boys, two of his boys, on guard duty out at the barn. And he told them, said, no, I ain't going to steal no horses. And if you're going to spend the night here, okay, but you're going to sleep out there in the barn. And my boys are going to be a guard. And when, they, when Booth and Harold went out there, got in the barn, they, locked, they padlocked the door where they couldn't get out. And it was a slap barn. You know what a slap barn is, don't you? Like the old corn cribs or be a slot here and then there'll be an empty space and stuff. You know, you, you've seen them at you and all. Now, after a time, Union soldiers arrive. And they worked over Mr. Garrett pretty good getting information. It didn't take him long telling him well, he's out there in the barn. So they went out there and they talked to him in there and they got talking. And Booth told him he wasn't coming out. He'd take, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll fight one of you soldiers at a time or all of them at a time. Well, I'm not coming out. And he was on crutches and with a weapon. And Harold said, well, I just soon surrender myself. And Booth called him every name he could think of, but he didn't kill him. I think he had shot him. But he let him walk out of there. He unlocked it, let him walk out. He got away from the barn. And Booth says, I ain't coming out. Well, they got some torches and torched the barn. Now you know, on them, if you've been on farms, and I'm sure y'all have, uh, they don't want you smoking or having fire around their barn, do they? Have hay and stuff or burning, just like that. They set that barn on fire. Booth, you can see the silhouette of Booth, but the orders had been from Lafayette Baker, who was the commanding officer there with this group, the officer, union officer. He's to be taken alive. Well, that plan went awry. Sergeant Boston Corbett, C-O-R-B-E-T-T. -E he got up close enough to the barn and he shot it right in the back of the neck. It severed the spinal cord. They carry him out of the barn and take over. And Miss Holloway, who was Garrett's sister, came out with a towel, put the towel in her lap, and laid Booth's head in her lap, and she took care of him until he died. And right there at the end, Booth looked up at her and says, pick up my hands, let me see my hands. He couldn't pick them up. He was paralyzed. And she picked him up and he looked at his hands this way, and he said, useless, useless. That was his last words. And he died. Now he was taken to the Washington Penitentiary and Arsenal where they will actually hang the conspirators. They told him he was on a ship out in the Potomac River. They told all kinds of things. So the people wouldn't get him. Well, Ms. Holloway, she was a school teacher. 
She kept a lock of his hair. She cut off a lock of his hair and kept it. And she kept that bloody pillowcase for many years. Then she sold half of it, cut it in half, during because she was didn't have much money for a barrel of flour. She traded a uh, that pillowcase for a barrel of flour. Now, the military trial, we got, I believe, time to go through that. The judge at the military trial was General Joseph Holt. The Secretary of War Stanton will orchestrate it. Only evidence that will convict will be used. All objections by the defense was disallowed. All objections by the prosecution was allowed. And also, what he did, this is cruel and inhumane. He made canvas hoods and put an inch thick. Now, we're talking 100 degree weather, ladies and gentlemen, and they had to wear this whole time this canvas hood with a drawstring with just a place for the mouth to breathe, and they had it in cotton, and he put cotton balls about an inch thick right there that they constantly, that they fit right against your eyes. Now take your hands and just do that pressure. That'd be pretty hard to have that on you all the time, wouldn't it? And they had to wear that thing. And you can imagine how hot that was today when they were in this courtroom. And, and, and it, that was the only time I believe they got to take them off was in the courtroom. Other than that, they had to wear them the whole time. It was inhumane. But they did let them take off because they said, this is not right. Now, there were six generals and two colonels. And one of those generals was General Lewis Wallace. Anybody ever heard of him? He was a writer. You ever heard of the book Ben Hur or the movie? Well, you might not. Okay. Well, he, he was the writer of that. Now, the trial is carried. There was no doubt what was going to happen. But here, here's the verdict Mary Surratt, Louis Payne, George Adzerod, David Harrell. Death by hanging. Now the platform or the gallows would be 20, 24 feet, four gallows, they would all drop exactly at the same time. The others went to prison with Dr. Mudd, O'Lawton, Spangler, Arnold, they all went to a prison, Tortugas Island. T-O-R-T-U-G-U-S. It's also called Devil's House off the coast of <coughs> the Gulf. Terrible place to be. Mrs. Lincoln, as they were preparing her to hang, I don't know whether they took a veil or they took something, a piece of something, but anyway, they tied it around her right here because she, you know, she wore a long dress back then. And they didn't want that dress. And what it would do is she dropped that quick. And she just kept saying the whole time until they pulled it, don't let me fall. Don't let me fall. Who was that? Huh? Who got her? Who are you talking about? Mary Surratt. And she is, I told you, she's the only one. She was the first woman to be legally hanged that we have a record of. Now, I thought this was amusing. And even, now, David, I mean, uh, when uh, he got the pain, when the hangman got the pain, he whispered to him, I'm going to fix this noose to where you will die quickly. Which, that was a plus. Mary Surratt lived for She hung there five minutes before it crushed everything in there. But you know, pain defended Mary Surratt. Says, I deserve to die. I was in this. I deserve it. She does not deserve to die. But Mary Surratt had to die, according to the Secretary of War, as an example to women. You don't get involved in a plot like this. Everybody else hangs and you don't. But she did not deserve to hang. He said, I'm going to fix it to where you will die quickly. Payne replied, you know best. And so they dropped them. 
and the justice is carried out in this trial. If you'd like to know kind of what happened, some of them, Major Rathbun and his wife, Clara Harris, he went insane, took a bath, and murdered her. This is a good crowd. Killed his wife. Boston Corbett, he got quite a bit of money for killing Booth. Disappeared, basically, don't know. <laughs> John Surratt, as I told you, he got out of the country, went to Europe, worked for the Papal State, the Vatican, returned home, and was found not guilty. Now, I think I've already mentioned this, John Parker continued on the staff. Yes. Then he did on staff, and as I said, he showed up with Lizzie Williams. Well, that's it in a nutshell. This book here is by Bill O'Reilly. It's pretty good. It is, it is pretty much, we're pretty much on the same page as Bill O'Reilly. But killing uh, Kennedy, as I said, if I had to give him a grade for that book, I'd probably see how close we were. I'd probably give him a C minus, and that'd be a good, good gift.